Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to episode 47 of the Hollywood and Toto podcast. This week we're speaking with Sarah Taxler. She's the director of the excellent documentary Tickling Giants about Egypt's version of Jon Stewart, Bassam Yusuf. You can find more about the film at ticklinggiants.com. She's also a producer on the new Comedy Central show The Opposition with Jordan Klepper. But before our chat, I wanted to apologize for this podcast. Not the content. I'm confident that the HitCast shares a take on Hollywood that you won't find elsewhere. But I have to be honest, I've really been struggling on the tech side of the show. Bigly, as a certain politician might say. Some interview subjects were only available via the phone. So when a Bruce Campbell comes my way, I've got to talk to him, even if it wasn't via Skype and other methods, which would have a much clearer, crisper sound. So I used some subpar recording methods to make sure that I got them on audio for the show. And I think those conversations were fine. But from a quality point of view... They weren't what I expected, and they certainly weren't up to the standards I want for the Hollywood and Toto podcast. And because I keep about a dozen plates spinning each week, I didn't have the time to fix the problem. I run HollywoodandToto.com. I co-host two radio shows. I write for several different publications, including PJ Media and Acculturated.com. I've got two young boys. One is six and one is eight. They keep me crazy busy. But the tech gap was still there, still bothering me, and it was still on my mind. So... Recently, I went out and bought some new technology, which should have a better sound overall, and more importantly, should increase the fact that you can listen to the interviews without any sort of stubbornness, any hissing, or other problems that have plagued some of the recent interviews. Again, I am sorry, and uh, hopefully moving forward, the show will sound better, and you'll have less problems hearing every last syllable with the interviews. The best is yet to come, I promise. And of course, if you have any feedback on anything about the show, please let me know. You can email me at Christian, like the religion, at HollywoodInToto.com. It's my official email. I would love to hear some feedback. Are there guests you'd like to hear on the show? Is there a new feature you'd like, an old feature you're just sick and tired of? Let me know. I'm all ears. Just be gentle, and I will do the best I can. In other Hollywood and Toto podcast news, I wanted to share a little bit about this week's guest before the official introduction. Yes, Tickling Giants is a very good movie. I really hope people check it out. It's smart, solid storytelling. But, you know, when I first created the HitCast, I didn't want to just feature right of center voices. Yes, this is a right of center site. I wanted to give a voice to people who share that, especially artists who are working in entertainment circles and need a little extra attention. That was the focus of it. But I also didn't want this to be an echo chamber. I didn't want to just have the same old voices or at least the same old opinions. So I wanted to have other voices here, maybe left of center perhaps, uh, and have those conversations, have good quality chats about what's going on in the entertainment world throughout the show. And I haven't done that nearly as much as I wanted to. But you know what? With Sarah here on this week's show, she was a producer on The Daily Show for 12 years. And if you look at her Twitter page, well, I think you're going to Pretty, pretty sure she's left of center, politically speaking. But you know what? That's okay. And to her credit, when I told her about this show and the way this show leans, she didn't blink. She wanted to talk about her movie, and she was very open to talking with someone who had a right of center personality. So that's you know good for her. She really wants to share the news about her film, but also doesn't want to just speak to the choir. So, And the bottom line is that Tickling Giants is a good film that appeals to both the right and the left. We should all want more freedom of speech, more uh, people and personalities speaking out against the powerful. That's what he did in the film. It's captured beautifully. And that's what we should see more of across the spectrum in not just Western culture, but across the world. So... I'll be curious to see what you think of her interview and also some of her answers to questions I don't think she's been asked before. At least I don't, I imagine she didn't. But uh, I'm going to ask those questions. I'm going to keep on doing it, you know, of course, gently and with respect. But that's part of the reason why the Hollywood and Toto podcast exists. You're listening to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. 
the right take on entertainment. My hit tip of the week is while we're young. You know, I was crushed by Brad status, which I saw a few weeks ago. It's the latest Ben Stiller movie, and it had a lot of hoopla coming up before its release. But boy, I tell you, the movie itself was disappointing. But while we're young is different. Stiller plays a documentary filmmaker who kind of starts a bromance of sorts with a quirky millennial. That's Adam Driver. Also, Naomi Watts is the uh, co-star here. She plays Ben Stiller's wife. It's a film that's funny. It's frustrating at times, but it's also very smart about the human condition. And I love that in any film. I think it's really well played here. And I think it's the kind of film you talk about afterwards. And again, those are qualities that I absolutely love in any kind of film. While We're Young was just added to the Netflix streaming library. So give it a tumble, as the great Dennis Miller would say, and let me know what you think. Franklin Graham calls it a must-see. Don't you dare tell me about the love and the compassion of your so-called God. Mike Huckabee calls it a giant step forward for the faith-based genre. Do you believe that God hears? God always answers prayers. Jerry Falwell Jr. says Let There Be Light offers forgiveness and hope when it's needed most. Kevin Sorbo and Sean Hannity present the most anticipated Christian movie of the year. Let There Be Light. Rated PG-13. May be inappropriate for children under 13. Now playing. Find a theater at lettherebelightmovie.com. Now let's get to my chat with Sarah Taxler. Sarah had a pretty steady gig with a daily show for years and years, but you know, when Egyptian comic Bassam Yusuf dropped by the show, it got her thinking. Would it be great to do a documentary about Egypt's answer to Jon Stewart? That's just what she did, but she had no idea what she was up against when she started the project. Just shooting on the streets of Egypt was challenging and sometimes dangerous. She had to make some interesting decisions to make sure that she got the footage she needed, but didn't put herself too much in harm's way. So you're going to find out more about that situation. Also, I want to get her thoughts on the current political climate when it comes from a satirical point of view. Of course, late night TV is all over Trump. Saturday Night Live is the same. What are her thoughts as a, as a Daily Show alum and as someone working on The Opposition, a new show, which tackles some pretty similar material? How does she view the landscape? And are conservatives right to be a little bit cranky about how things are covered and what things are not covered? So you're going to find out all about that and certainly more about her film Tickling Giants with this interview. Here's my chat with Sarah Taxler. Well, Sarah, thanks okay. for taking uh, your time to join the show. You know, Tickling Giants wasn't an easy documentary to make by any stretch. I mean, the the Egyptian scene was exploding uh, through years. You, you were faced danger when you're shooting certain situations. Looking back on the whole process, what was the most daunting part of you, part of it for you as a filmmaker? Well, I think, I mean, the hardest part is deciding if you're going to take on a project. And and honestly, it wasn't so much related to um, the situation in Egypt as much as um, I had a full-time job that I was doing this on top of. I was working at The Daily Show and the thought of doing a full-time job on top of a full-time job uh, was <laughs> overwhelming thought and um was certainly difficult in terms of the actual filming i think probably the the single hardest detail was um i was traveling alone as a female i don't speak the language i'm um i don't look egyptian you know so i'm I'm not egyptian so i um stood out and i think um you know during any period of turmoil anywhere things are really rough and particularly for women can be dangerous so i think even though like my experience on the whole was very positive there were like some moments where they felt uncomfortable or like potentially dangerous that that were difficult and i just couldn't afford to bring a crew so i, I didn't have anyone there that i knew that was like a, that was a little tough Gotcha. You know, I understand you had to get creative at times while you were shooting in Egypt. Can you maybe share a story or two or a moment where you couldn't do the conventional production situation where you had to be a bit craftier to make sure that you got the footage you wanted? Yeah, well, um, one example of that was just um, the methods of physically shooting the footage. Like it, As we were filming, it got more and more um, difficult to mm-hmm. film in Egypt, particularly outside. So like we had had an instance where um, one of our camera people was beaten up for his footage when he was filming at like an outdoor um, gathering where people would watch the show. And so we were trying to figure out ways to make it safer. And we started filming 
most of our outdoor footage from a moving car. Mm -hmm. And I would just use a little point and shoot tourist camera because tourists can take pictures and it's not weird, but uh, people walking around with any people um, feel more just uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. Yeah. um, We were concerned about getting the footage out of the country for a few different times when the show looked like it was going to be canceled or different things were going on. And so we had, um, I was in New York and I wanted to get the hard route, but we weren't sure if we mailed it, if it would get checked and opened. Um, <clears throat> just because Bossom was a particularly um, uh, divisive guy and we knew the government had a lot of opinions on him. So we had um, a person who um, worked at the show, knew someone who knew someone who was coming to the U S and so this complete stranger just brought a hard drive to me and we just met up on the street in New York and she handed me a package and it totally felt like a drug dealer or something <laughs> like that, but it was just a hard drive of movie footage. Uh-huh. Um, so sort of be aware of how we're getting things and um, in terms of both filming and, and getting materials out safely. Yeah, I think I want to see a documentary about the shooting of your documentary. But, uh, <laughs> interesting. but yeah, it was, <laughs> uh, it was a, a complicated, interesting process. Yeah, I can imagine. Now, I, it's impossible to watch Tickling Giants without thinking about comparing and contrasting Egyptian culture and satire and comedy to Western and more, more specifically American culture and, and society. It's easy for American audiences to say, oh, we're more open, we're more inclusive, we don't chase the, the John Stewarts and the, uh, the Jordan Kleppers out of the country for saying something. But I, was good, I wanted to kind of flip the script. What do you think that Americans can learn from what's happening in Egypt and what, what Bassem went through? I mean, is, is there sort of other lessons there that we can take away? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. It, it was interesting for me. Um, I obviously watched the movie – hundreds of times while we're making it and then afterwards. And then um, the weekend after the U S presidential election, I was at a screening and I watched it and suddenly I was like, this just feels really different. The energy in the room was different. And I think prior to that, at the screenings we'd had, people were identifying it as like, Oh, I have an interest in um, comedy or maybe they saw Bassem on The Daily Show, but they didn't necessarily feel personally connected. And suddenly, I think a lot of people, really regardless of their politics, um, felt some commonalities. And, and part of that is the fact that like free speech um, is so under attack now. And, and one thing that's been really interesting to me is people on the left and the right both seem to agree on this. They have different reasons. I think it's under attack. For people on the left, it's about... Um, attacking the media, attacking news. And for people on the right, it's um feeling of being attacked on college campuses for speech issues. But like both ads were just suddenly concerned in a very personal way actually. Yeah. About when I see the movie. And that was really interesting to see. And even my editor, who was like the last person to touch the film watched it again a few months later and he was like, did you change something? And I said, no, it's a movie. Like we just changed. Uh, so it, it, I think one viewer at that first screening after the U S election said to me, this is a cautionary tale for America. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true. I think the U S has a history of free speech that we'd love to have in Egypt. Hasn't had that. So they're very, very different countries. Um, but I think Right now is when you're like you're seeing kind of like whispers and then you're starting to see shouts of, of these things going on that are threatening um, free speech and, and protecting the media and, and all that in this country. And people decide if they're going to um, cherish that value and protect it or if they're willing to compromise it out of fear. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, Abbasim is obviously living in exile now. I think he might be in the United States, maybe even in L.A., working on some deals. You know, What's that? That's right. He lives okay. in L.A. Gotcha. I, you know, his impact was considerable back home. And I, I I look at what's happening now with his life and what he's going through. And I think, yeah, what's your take on, are you hopeful that he can go back home at some point in the near future? And I- even if he doesn't continue his particular show, keep doing things like it? Or do you think that the culture needs more change and there's more evolution to happen before that can take place? Well, I mean, I'm always hopeful that 
someone can do whatever they want to do as long as they're not hurting somebody else. So mm-hmm. if he wanted to go home, I would certainly hope that it would be safe for him to do so right now. You know, there's no way for him to know if he'd be put in jail or, or what would happen. So he can't go back, mm-hmm. um, which is obviously really hard. It's not somebody leaving by choice and who can't be in their home. I know awesome has said, um, Sometimes when we've done Q and A's, people have asked about that, and feeling is like the Egypt he grew up with doesn't exist right now. Um, so he, it's not that he misses the place physically of Egypt; mm-hmm. he misses the the culture and um, what Egypt is for him, which yeah. he thinks isn't existing right now. Um, but like, you know, it's hard. Like the family there, like they can't do what they want, and so I think. The only thing he can do is just focus on being where he is and making his life whatever he can make of it and, and try to enjoy it still. And so he's in L.A. hoping to to be in the satire world in the U.S. Hmm. Yeah, I think he'll be a great voice here. <laughs> that, that sounds exciting. Uh, you know, when you think about political comedy, you got deep roots with the, with the opposition and The Daily Show and, and projects and uh, other sort of related projects. I always think about political comedy of the modern age, and I tie it back to Tina Fey. When she played Sarah Palin on Saturday Night Live, I felt like it was a, a cultural moment where it wasn't just a funny impression. It really impacted the way we saw Palin as a political figure on the scene. And I, I was kind of curious from your perspective, you, you know, you're in these trenches and you do the comedy that, that deals with politics and satire. Do you think that that was an important moment in our culture in a way, or do you think there's something else going on maybe even after that, where it truly showed what political comedy can mean or, or can even result in? Well, oh, um, I love Tina Fey. I'm definitely a fan of hers. And I, I think a different moment of hers for me where I was just like, oh, this is a thing comedy can do. And it was right after 9-11 and she was um, doing something on SNL where she was just talking about basically how scared she was and that everything she did was so scary and how she would take her passport in the shower with her and everything was so scary. And I thought like what was fun about that is that was the real emotion that mm-hmm. everybody was feeling in, in this part of the world. And um, she was able to like make it really funny. And uh, I don't you know specifically political comedy I think that's probably like a personal thing where it's like it's it clicks for an individual and it's like, oh, yeah, this means something. But I definitely think um, comedy can point out hypocrisies and repetition of behaviors that could be alarming in a way that like people are more receptive to. On Boston show, Tickling Giants, we were um, following them when Morsi was president. And this one woman on the staff told me that her mom was like a big Morsi fan. And then... Um, when they would like point out his hypocrisies, her mom was very resistant to it. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, just, like a few in a row and she started to be like, Oh, it was real. Because that really, and her daughter was like, yeah, that's real footage. And just sort of the, um, consistency of pointing it out each time he would do something different than he said he was doing made her start to change her opinion. Cause she was like, Oh, that's not what he tells us he stands for. And mm-hmm. so I think, and maybe the Palin thing for you was like that. Like it was just like Tina Fey nailed going after like every little detail of her behaviors in a way that showed, okay, this is a caricature, but this is a lot that represents who the person is. Yeah. And I think it also just the way the media took off with it and the way it, it seemed to be echoed in the public's perception of her too. I think it was sort of this, this avalanche of, of events. But uh, you know, here's a question I had for you, and I was kind of curious cause, because of w- sort of where you stand politically and also just the work you do on late night. I always thought that late night TV was ripe for a, if not even a right of center host, and maybe even a libertarian host, a guy or a gal who's you know in charge of a show, and he or she could hit the left, but also hit the right and go back and forth. And you look at the landscape today, it's mostly left of center, and I, th- I think that most people would agree on that. Do you think, just given your perspective, that a right of center host a new show on any network, would that work? Would that thrive? Or or is it the fact that the Trump effect is here sort of maybe changes everything? Uh, I, you know, I think 
if something's funny, it can do well. And that regardless of who's in charge. And I think things that don't succeed, the public has decided aren't funny enough to be worth their time. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think there's a rule about what can work. I would say typically, um, comedy goes against or, or satire goes against whatever's in power and not, um, not goes against them, but, uh, like, takes a close look at mm-hmm. and so the group in power is easier to make fun of than the group not in power um but that's not meaning just a specific person or political party it just you satire to to knock it mm-hmm. <laughs> and so um it, that would just be my own gotcha. kind of observation on that but yeah sure what i mean anything could be funny i think um it's it's a lot easier to uh it, to me personally, I'm like, you'd have suffering right now if, gotcha. if you're on the alt right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I had two other questions. Uh, one is I want to ask you'd mentioned in our emails back and forth that, that your film is a long shot for the award season. And I, I, I wanted to maybe just break that down for the listeners because I think that's it's important. And I also like the fact that in the media today, there are different ways to get around things. You know, the old system is not the only system. You think about, you know, uh, Justin Bieber became a star in part because he was on YouTube and, you know, Millions of people loved his stuff. From your perspective, with a movie like that, is what are your what are you up against, and and how are you going to hopefully kind of circumvent that? Well, my biggest goal for Dick Lane Giants is for people to see the film and discuss the film. And the movie is about Boston, but it's really just about how people can find creative, nonviolent ways to express themselves mm-hmm. when they see an abuse of power. And we're all seeing abuses of power. And so, the more people who see the movie, to me, that's the success of it. But like in the world, the bigger movies that have the distributors and commercials and ads on Facebook and all the stuff for the ones that people hear about. And that's like, you know, obvious, right? Yep. That's something all the time. We're going to want to check it out. So like we've gotten great press and we've been very lucky. We have a hundred percent of Rotten Tomatoes, but most people still haven't heard of the movie and I have funding to do this ad campaign or, you know, on billboards or any of the things that certain other films back can do so um we're applying for awards but it is a long shot because typically the the ad space and everything else is Mm -hmm. bought up by like netflix and amazon and and these these big more powerful groups so my hope is that through word of mouth uh, and people who like it spreading uh their voices Mm -hmm. will know about the movie see the movie to friends and um can be like a little bit of an underdog that could and then, and hopefully um, stand out, maybe even get shorted for awards or things like that. Gotcha. All right. I had one last question, and this is something that I think is on the minds of a lot of conservatives who watch late night TV and maybe more specifically Saturday Night Live. They felt like during the Obama years that the comedian, I guess, landscape, for lack of a better phrase, wasn't tough enough on him. Now, obviously, Trump is the juiciest, easiest target in modern history, and that's a no-brainer to kind of uh, you know, tee off on him, and we get that. And I think even Trump fans get that, too. I thought as a, as a, as a consumer of content and as a permanent right of center, the comedians, you know, the key and peels of the world, SNL, they, they kind of pull back a bit. And, you know, obviously, Daily Show you know, targeted uh, Obama at times when you were sort of working the show. What, is that a fair critique do you think or and what's your take on that real quickly um i don't i don't really think so i think it's just um you know the the person telling the joke i don't think has an obligation to present it the way that their audience wants them to present it i think mm-hmm. their obligation is just to pursue the stories they find interesting and want to tell i think that that doesn't mean if you see something that's an obvious hypocrisy you should be ignoring it um but i think under Obama, maybe the people who you think weren't going as hard, maybe they just had a different opinion mm-hmm. um, and, and didn't see those things as criticisms. It's all it's all about what the person watching feels and what the comedian feels. So, you know, maybe it's just not a rally. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Well, again, thank you for taking the time to speak to the HitCast. The movie is Tickling Giants. It is terrific. It is the kind of movie you think about long after it's over. I hope you check it out. It's available on iTunes, Amazon, that's where I saw it, and also ticklinggiants.com. And also check out The Opposition with Jordan Klepper, weeknights at 1130 on Comedy Central. Sarah is the uh, supervising producer on that show as well after a long run on The Daily Show. Sarah, thanks so much for your time, and let's talk again about future projects. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Take care. 
Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out HollywoodandToto.com for both the show notes and, of course, the latest entertainment news. Please follow me at Twitter at Hollywood and Toto. And we'd love it if you leave a podcast review over at iTunes. See you next week.